In this episode of Ideas, I talk with Sean Askinosi of Askinosi Chocolate about his new book, Meaningful Work, A Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling, and Feed Your Soul. And I'm glad to call Sean a friend now, but you'll especially want to listen to the end of the episode. Make sure you listen to the entire episode, but at the very end, he says something very profound related to finding our purpose. All right, let's dive in. Here we go. All right, today's guest is Sean Askinosi. In 2005, he left a successful career as a criminal defense lawyer to start a bean-to-bar chocolate factory and never looked back. Recently named by Forbes one of the 25 best small companies in America, Askinosi Chocolate has also been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and numerous other national and international media outlets. And today he's here to talk about his new book, Meaningful Work. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate the chance to talk to you. And I can honestly say this. I loved your book. It was vulnerable. It was the full story. It was just, it was good writing. (laughs) It was everything you want a book to be. And so uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation just because not only the book, but we've had a chance to email back and forth. I mentioned you on the blog. That might be the first time that Mm -hmm. You had kind of known that I knew about you, and I found out about you from reading a Forbes article and uh, read about your work there, and it really intrigued me, and you own a chocolate company, so (laughs) it's just, it's, I just love your story, and so I kind of want to dive into that because, one, I think it's valuable, and two, I think it's really interesting, so if you would, you know, one of the things you talk about in your book, you talk about your father's death, I don't know how vulnerable you want to get on the show, but be as vulnerable as you'd like, skip whatever you'd like to, but I just wanted to ask you about your journey, and if you would share about not only that time, but what's brought you from there to where you're at now. Sure, thank you, thanks for asking, and it's been many years since my father's death, I am 57 years old today, and yes, so, that's right. I, Happy uh, birthday. <laughs> and, well, thank you. No, thank you. This is, uh, this is awesome. And uh, I was 14 when my dad died. And, and uh, there are times when I, I think about him a lot. And, and then there are times when I can go for many, many days and it's not. But it, it still shapes my life even mm-hmm. to this day. And I don't mind talking about it. It is part of my story and it's part of who I am and, and why I am. And so what happened basically, and you'll please interrupt me if I, if I get too, too long winded on this, but when my, when I was uh, 12, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer and the church at the time, we were in an Episcopal church that was charismatic and they would come over, a prayer group would come over and lay hands on my father and speak in tongues. And it kind of scared me at first, but Mm -hmm. they would tell me to not speak with my father about death. They said that if we talked about death, that it would be a sign of doubt. He wouldn't be healed. So we never talked about it. And, and when my dad would try to talk with me about it, I pushed him away and said, you know, dad, don't, don't bring that up. And wow. anyway, he kept getting sicker and sicker and cancer spread throughout his body. And I was helping to take care of him at the time. We didn't have hospice in those days. And so I was, gosh, I was 13, giving him Demerol shots sometimes six or seven times a day. And I was with him when he died, and it was the most desperate moment of my life. Um, the cancer had gone to his brain, and he basically had a stroke, and it was at home, and I wasn't expecting it because I thought he was going to live. I thought mm-hmm. there would be this miracle of you know, reversal of this cancer. And yeah. so um, I, I just begged God out loud, literally, you know, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. And, and he did. And I, I spent the next 25 years essentially saying to myself and to God, well, I don't need you. I'm, I'm going to prove I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to be something, and I'm going to accomplish all of these things. And and so I did. I, I accomplished a lot of stuff in 25 years, and you know, became a lawyer and a successful criminal defense lawyer. Never lost a criminal jury trial, and really made my reputation in the defense of murder cases, which those aren't easy and they're quite stressful. And I loved my work, and my dad was a lawyer, so I felt like I was following in his footsteps. And then there just came this time. You know, after 20 years of, of, of just saying, you know, um, I don't love this anymore. And I have no, no hobbies, no skills besides preparing for the courtroom. And I just knew I had to get out. Yeah. And, you know, this is not the kind of job that you can kind of half-ass your way through. I mean, you can't phone it in if you have someone's life 
you know, in your hands, literally. And so I, I had to get out, had to do something else. You know, there's, there's so much I want to dive into there. Um, first being your relationship with the religion. And this isn't something, I mean, I've had guests like Bob Goff where we, True. where we uh, have talked because his background is, you know, lawyer and he's a religious man himself. But you with religion, like did that moment run that for you completely? I mean, later, your relationship with God, you mentioned God. Has, was that destroyed from that sense? Did people, because compl- from that, I mean, God didn't destroy that, people did. And, and when you sure. put people in the mix, we mess things up. But what's your view on that? Yeah, the I, I, as I reflect back on it, I mean, my father was raised Jewish in New York City, met my mom, a Southern Baptist from Southwest Missouri, farm girl, and of course, I was raised in Episcopalian. That just makes sense. But, um, but you know, here's the thing. When I look back on that, I don't think that my faith was ruined or destroyed because I don't think I ever had it to begin with. I mean, I went to church and I was confirmed and all that stuff. But I mean, I don't think I really knew what it meant. I mean, so sure. it was sort of a twisted presentation for me in the beginning of, you know, all of this prosperity theology that I don't believe is faith to begin with. I mean, I think the foundations and premises of it are faulty. And so Mm -hmm. 25 years later, when I decide to sort of, I mean, I've been going to church, I mean, with my family and my wife um, is Methodist and we went to a Methodist church, but I I don't, I never, I don't think I listened. I didn't, I I just went. But then, you know, as a part of this process of, let's say, having a conversation, a true conversation with my grief over my father's death, you know, 20, 25 years later, part of that process was going to visit the monastery near my house in Southwest Missouri, about an hour from me, where my father spent his last night. Mm. He went on a church retreat at this Trappist monastery uh, in the middle of the Mark Twain National Forest. And I decided, you know, that was where he spent his last night. And he was visited by angels there, according to his priest. And that story was told to me at his funeral and meant nothing to me. But I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna. I, I need to go see that place. Well, mm-hmm. now, seven, 17 years later, I'm very, very involved and have a relationship with that monastery and that abbey, and and I'm a family brother there, and and I live with the monks when I'm there, and I practice their schedule, and so a lot has happened. And so I would say that really, really, what that was was an establishment of a healthy faith as opposed to sort of a return to faith or, you know, and so I feel like it was that now I'm in a much healthier relationship with my faith than I was in high school when I did, I, I, all I knew was what was presented to me as this twisted prosperity theology. And so now I feel much, it, 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 it literally, I mean, and you can tell from the book, I mean, my faith is a center point in my life for sure. Absolutely. And you know, it, I only ask because I was brought up in church too, and I have a relationship with God still. But there, there were times in my life, of course, where I questioned and doubted, and I think it's only natural. But just wanted to get your take on that because of just wow, the circumstances around that, and you tell about that in your book as well, where they, you know, told you not to talk to your dad about death and to have a a religious figure tell you that. I didn't know how that really affected that relationship with God. That's why I went there. But the second thing you mentioned in your story that's really uh, interesting is you came to this point to where you didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. And I just wanted to ask you, what were the signs pointing that it was time to leave? Mm-hmm. Because, if, you know, people listening might be at that crossroads in their life at a, right. they, a job that they feel that they don't have a hunger for or they just feel like it's time to, to move on to something else. Mm-hmm. And, and then the uh, second part to that question is, you know, why chocolate? Because, you know, leaving from the lawyer to go do that, that's just really interesting. And there's a lot of business owners listening as well. I'm a business owner myself, and I know why I've taken the path that I did. But as you reflect on it, are there any key takeaways from your journey that you might want to share here? As to the first part of your question, um, how did I know and I, I think that many of your listeners can relate to this, and that is when you love something for a long time or a short time and you feel connected to it and drawn to it and, and, and that it is your purpose or, as I say, vocation, it's okay to then have this dramatic or even not so dramatic but gradual shift to, man, 
this doesn't feel good anymore. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think this is for me anymore. That's okay. You know, <laughs> sixty years ago we couldn't do that. My grandparents couldn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I don't think I want to farm anymore. I mean, yeah. they yeah. just wouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. But right. but you know, they would have pushed through. But for me, I literally felt it emotionally, physically to some extent, as we've discussed spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't one moment, although as I reflect back, it, I can see, looking back, I can see kind of the moment um, after the conclusion of a murder trial that I had, which I won and felt good about. But I described a scene in the book where my client, this very demure, small one that weighed about 100 pounds, um, really switched roles with me and became the comforter to me right before we went back into the courtroom at the conclusion of the case. And so that sort of switch in roles where she was literally, you know, comforting me at the conclusion of the case, which is the opposite of what it normally is. So that's one thing. So when you feel this kind of switch or flip-flop in roles, or for some people, and in my case, and there were some days where I felt little mini panic attacks in the courtroom on just routine matters. I mean, just going in for a motion and it wasn't any big deal but my chest would start to tighten up and I was like, what is going on? And it took, because I, I am and remain, you know, a very motivated, driven, hard charging person. It took a kind of dramatic shaking of what my sort of core to get my attention mm -hmm. that this isn't, this is not working. It's not good for me. And so I need it out. So, it, it, and that's a much different scenario than someone who's, listening who may say, well, I like what I do, but I think there's something more for me someplace else or in this other space, or I think I can do this other thing better. That's a different thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's still related, sure. but, but I mean, literally I was, you know, taking Lexapro and visiting a psychologist and really suffering from depression at this time for both being so desperate to find the next thing and really having no success at finding something that was going to be my next inspiration. So why chocolate? I, you know, I honestly, I, I mean, I try to articulate it in the book, but I don't, there was just sort of this gradual thing of, you know, I thought, well, I'll have, a, I'll, I'll try a hobby of cooking outdoors. So I bought a big green egg and started making a bunch of stuff outside, you know, turkeys and hams and ribs and burgers and steaks. And then I started baking uh, inside and I started making pies and then chocolate desserts. And from chocolate desserts, one day I'm driving to the relative of a distant funeral by myself just, you know, thinking about, well, what am I going to do, man? I can't. And I thought, oh, I think I'll make chocolate from scratch. Mm, and I had yeah. no idea what that meant. I didn't know what, <laughs> I didn't even know what a cocoa bean looked like. Huh, but yeah, I don't within, either. <laughs> well, within three months of that, I was in the Amazon wow. and, and studying how farmers, you know, grow this stuff and how they influence the flavor by how they harvest the beans. And, and so that, and then I just, you know, started unwinding my law practice, which took a year and started buying equipment and bought a building and, as you said in the intro, never looked back. And But there's this sort of process during the five-year period of, oh, gosh, what am I going to do with my life, the rest of my life, and sure. chocolate. And those five years were tough. And sure. they were they were really challenging for me. I mean, at the end of it, I mean, you're, you think it's still okay to just question anything because, I mean, we wouldn't care about it if we didn't question things, in your opinion, correct? I mean, we're supposed to be questioning these things all the time, aren't we? Or, I mean, you mean questioning like what? Questioning like, what? Uh, like career movement and things. I mean, oh, sure. Do you think that humans ever get to that point where we are completely satisfied? This, uh, I mean, this message. Yeah, we're dead. Yeah, I mean, that, this <laughs> message that has just been communicated over and over forever that you're supposed to get to this point to where just complete bliss and satisfaction it just seems so false the more it people is, i talk to it is false and here's the thing and there's this really there's there can be fine lines between just hip hopping from one job or even one career to the next with you know not a great deal of thought or attraction and it's sort of the shiny object in your periphery and you think, oh, I think I'll go do that. There's certainly something that lies between that and staying in this dead-end job that is literally taking years off of your life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have actually blogged about this, and there's a tenets of monastic life and Benedictine rule is something called the rule of stability. Mm -hmm. And what, the, what, what that is is it's a practice. It's a discipline. 
And what that means is that you're just not going to just leave the monastery because, you know, you're not getting along with your fellow monks. And so they really make a commitment in the, to this discipline of stability. Huh. And I love that because I believe it's sort of a counterbalance to this idea of, oh, I think I'll go open this or oh, I think I'll go buy that franchise. And so I preach out of both sides of my mouth. On the one hand, I encourage people to really take a deep look and introspective consideration over their current place. You know, do they, do they want to stay in this job or do they want to leave? And what are all the considerations around? So I want people to feel like they can be encouraged and be brave and, mm -hmm. and move to the next place. But I also want them to, to know that they can be encouraged and be brave to stay right where they are That's good. and to have the discipline to push through. It really is a person by person, even year by year consideration, I think. That's really good advice. And that's a perfect segue into happiness, something that I wanted to talk to you about because it's something that comes up again and again on this show. But while we just talked about what you do with chocolate, I wanted to ask you because from the book, it, it, the takeaway for me is you really impact a lot of people because of what you do is, is called direct trade. And I wasn't aware of the difference. I had heard of fair trade before from Coldplay frontman Chris Martin. You know, I used to listen to Coldplay a lot, still do some, but he really kind of made it popular, if you will. I even worked one of his concerts for a company that promotes the fair trade movement. But what you do is direct trade. And I just wanted you, if you could, before we, this is kind of a side question, might not fit in, but I wanted to ask you anyway, what's the difference between fair trade, the one that is so popular and direct trade that I wasn't aware of. Maybe it's popular and I wasn't aware of it, but if you would, kind of talk to us about that. Fair trade is a is a um, certification that let's just take chocolate for example. You can buy fair trade certified chocolate, and I, I think originally it was a great concept and a great principle, and I think it's lifted um, the standard of living for farmers around the world. I do believe that now it's kind of become in many ways a victim of its own good marketing, okay. and um, by that, I mean, we, send it, we tend to have sort of a sense of complacency if we see the fair trade certification on a chocolate bar and think, well, all is well in the world if I'm paying a little extra for this bar. But unfortunately, what's happening, and, and I can't speak to other kinds of fair trade, but as it re relates to cocoa and chocolate, I, I know a little bit about it. And um, what, what's happening is the person who's buying cocoa beans, uh, fair trade certified cocoa beans, is paying a premium of only $150 to $200 per metric ton. Mm. And that's nothing. I mean, that's pennies when it comes to for a pound of chocolate. And so it's not enough. And study after study now recently has shown that farmers who are toiling away in this crop are making very little extra money over the fair trade, if any money at all, because it's all siphoned off in the supply chain. Direct trade, on the other hand, is not a certification. Uh, I'm my chocolate's not certified at all, direct trade. And I learned this practice from Intelligentsia Coffee based in Chicago, and they really are. Jeff Watts is the pioneer of direct trade coffee, and he helped me beginning and, and is still a friend to this day. But you, you sort of, you know, we define it. And so if you were opening your own direct trade fill in the blank, you can define it. We talk about it on our website. And basically for us, direct trade is first quality, um, second transactional and financial transparency, third we want the farmers to practice ecological and economic sustainability. Fourth, we want them to practice um, socially sound business practices. So, you know, no child labor, fair wages for the people who work for them. And then finally, that we travel to visit them. And this summer, when I want to go to Tanzania and take a bunch of high school students with me. It'll be my 40th origin trip. Wow. So I go a lot. And the other thing That's I'll great. say is we have published on our website the price that we've paid in every single bean buy that we've made since we started 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've we not only published the price, but how much we profit share with those farmers. We open our books to them. We translate our lang our financials into their language. So when I'm in Tanzania, it's in Swahili. And then we profit share with them and give them cash. And all of that is published on our website as it relates to what they might have otherwise received at what's called FarmGate. And yeah, we do post the, what the fair trade price would be and the world market price which a lot of people talk about, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is what would they have received otherwise at their own farm gate? And we've paid on average 48% more than farm gate price in the last 11 years. And we finance most of these terms. So we pay for these beans way in advance 
so the farmers have this capital to use to harvest their cocoa beans. That's direct trade in, wow. in, in, in a nutshell for us. I love that. And I mean, at the end of it, direct trade does seem like the best way to help others. And I think that's a lot of your purpose, a lot of your company's purpose at the heart of it. And uh, just the vibe I get from you from uh, our few exchanges and, and this talk is you truly want to help other people. And I, I think that speaks volumes, too, to your transparency, your complete honesty, running your business in that way. And it's something that all of us can take note of. Well, and, one, uh, I was just going to say, sorry to interrupt. One of the things oh. that I know you write a lot about and is important to you is relationships. Well, yeah. um this you could boil direct trade down to relationship mm. and you could you can say that one of my vocations is working with farmers and having a relationship some of these farmers like the one in ecuador i've been buying from the same guy for 11 years wow. and so and his family and, and i go there every year and so when i'm with these farmers there is a real true sense of connection that we have and have built up over the years and so when I say these things, like I just sort of recited the list of what is direct trade, we believe, I believe that if I gave you my recipe and gave you the cocoa beans or gave you, you know, said, here's how to do it, it wouldn't. And if you made a chocolate bar and I made a chocolate bar, it wouldn't be the same. Literally would not be the same because we believe that these practices that we've been talking about today and the relationships that we have literally are inseparable from the end product that we make. They are not, they're, they're literally so twisted and tied together in who we are as a company and what kind of chocolate we make and how it tastes and the quality of it, that they're not separable. And they have a direct impact on the chocolate bar that you would buy and hopefully enjoy. I, I love that you touched on that because that is so applicable for everyone. I mean, it makes you want to get back to the heart of the reason why you do what you do and, and making sure that that you truly are doing it for that reason. Wow. I wouldn't do it. If, if, mm -hmm. if I couldn't, if somebody said to me, if they walked in the front door, you know, and they said, well, you're not going to be able to go visit farmers anymore, um, or no one from your company can visit farmers. That's just not going to happen. And you can't work with students anymore. Um, I wouldn't have a chocolate company. Mm. That's how, I mean, it's, it's just who we are. And the, yeah. the message I'd like to say about this is to small, but we only have 16 people in our company mm. and we're feeding a thousand kids a day in between Tanzania and the Philippines, all sustainably. And, you know, like I said, we take these local high school students to Tanzania every other year where we have an elementary school program, middle school program, high school program, all with this little company. And the, so the message I, I want to say is, Hey, you don't have to have a big, huge company or a big bank account or anything fancy in order to solve problems and meet the needs of your community as a business person, as an entrepreneur. You can just cut a little bite off that you can chew up and digest and know that you're making a difference. And to me, this is sustainable change. And of course, it's, it's not scalable, but it is sustainable. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm saying if you were to take these things away from us, then we wouldn't be a company. But for many companies out there, they have this sort of dualistic approach where they silo their so-called philanthropy or charitable works in one corner of the company, otherwise known as corporate social responsibility departments. Um, and then the rest of the company is left hungry for some connection to meaningful work as is manifested in the other corner of the company, the corporate social responsibility department. And I'm saying, hey, open the doors to that department. Let it be infused through the entire company because it's going to make for more engaged employees and a better product in the end. To run a company with 16 people, you have to have engaged employees yourself. Yeah, That's amazing. Exactly. Yeah, or we wouldn't be able to make a chocolate bar. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was going to lead into happiness, but I think an even more important topic that this lends more to is I want to talk to you about purpose just for a little bit, because that fits in well here. The title of your book being Meaningful Work, and everybody's looking for purpose. From what you just said, it, to me, it really goes back to what you're talking about. And what I focus a lot on is relationships, is people. 
Uh, would you say that a lot of our purpose comes from that? And, you know, if it does, great. But if there's more to it, what would you say if there's someone looking for purpose, looking for meaning in their life? What are some keys for them that you would share with them right now? And of course, this might be, you know, a case by case scenario. But if there are a few keys that apply to everyone, what would those be? Well, you said it and you write about it and you talk about it and you said it, it's people. <laughs> I mean, we, we can we can put a lot of coatings on it or we yeah. can point in a different direction, refract the light and call it something else. But the bottom line is, if you want meaning in your life, if you want meaning in your work, then it's going to be about people. And it's going to be about the love that you have for the people in your life and that you try intentionally to have connection with. And so yeah. where I would start with an entrepreneur or someone thinking about this is I would say, tell me about your broken heart. Wow. And if you don't have a broken heart, then we have a lot more to talk about than I thought. And I, I look, I talk to middle school kids. I mean, I talk to high school kids and even I tell the middle school kids, look, I know you have, a, you've had a broken heart. It may not be like mine, a, you know, the death of a parent, but maybe your parents have been divorced. Maybe you've had to not know where the next meal is going to come from. Maybe you were brokenhearted over your girlfriend. I mean, what I want to tell people is let's look at your broken heart because I believe that your brokenheartedness is going to be this mysterious paradoxical key to finding the joy in your life and in your work. And what I encourage people to do is you know, kind of step away from the computer and books, including mine, and just step back and just try to have some solitude for a minute and take some deep breaths and say, you know, am I willing to roll up my sleeves and do this hard work of examining my own broken heart? Wow. wow. And that wow. Is where it all, that's where it all begins. I had three or four other questions I wanted to get to, but I feel safe with just leaving it there. Is that okay with you, Sean? I mean, <laughs> sure, that's, of course. it's not going to get better than that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Sean, it's been a great conversation with you. I try to ask this question to everyone. If there's one piece of advice that you'd like to leave people with, if it's that great, you know, if it's something else, great. But if it's something that we didn't get to today or something you just want to highlight, if there's one piece of advice, what would that be? The one piece of advice would be after you think about what I just said about your broken heart, then keep your sleeves rolled up, look down your street, look in your industry, look in your family, look in your neighborhood and say, who can I serve? Who can I serve? And how is it going to relate in some way to my broken heart? That's the life with that practice is one that is full and full of meaning. Yeah, there's some sorrow along the way, of course, but the, the life of joy from those two practices, I think, is immense. Wow. I love this episode. My goodness. Um, last question for you. Where would you like to send people to find out more about you and your work? Our website is askanosi.com, and people can read all about our chocolate, and there's tons of information there about how we make it and how we source it and where people can buy it. And then I have a little blog, seanaskanosi.com, where people can read more about some of the things that I'm thinking about and writing about. And, and you and I are kindred spirits, for sure, because I think we're thinking and writing and speaking about much of the same topic. So I really, really appreciate you you taking time with me, Adam. I really do. I appreciate you, sir. And I appreciate your curiosity. And that's why uh, you've landed on a lot of the things you have. It's why I've, I have people like you on the show and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you got something out of these ideas. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.